All right, looks like um, we are good to go. Nine o'clock, good morning, welcome everyone. Happy Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2024, Downtown Action Committee hearing. Yeah, could we start with roll call, please, JT? Roger Jansen. Present. Nick Melich. Present. Gregory Gabriel. Present. Kim Doe. Present. Samuel Grace. Present. Michael Bass. Present. May the record reflect Brian Chagas and Brad McPherson are not in attendance today. Perfect, thank you. Um, item two, minutes. Does anyone have any comments on the December minutes in the package? Any comments otherwise motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I make a motion to approve the minutes. All right, second. 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 Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye, opposed, not okay. Motion carries, uh, minutes from December 13th approved. Uh, item three, report from City Urban Designer. Claudia, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Claudia Babin, City Urban Designer. I just want to welcome Michael Basque here. He's our new board member, and this is his first meeting. So thank you for joining us today and for the rest of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> welcome. Right, yeah. yeah, welcome, Michael. Thank, thank, you. For your, thank you for your time. Okay, I'll skip any remarks when we get moving into today's um, protocol. Item five, declaration of ex parte communication. Anyone want to start, Gregory, any ex parte? Yes, um, yesterday I had a conversation with uh, Harvey Hoyer regarding the item we're discussing today, and that will not impact my the way I vote. Okay, good. Uh, Nick, you got anything? Yes, I also had a Zoom call with uh, Harvey and Roger of Schutz and Bowen, and that call will have no impact on my impartial judgment today. Okay. Um, Sam? Yeah, I, I also had a communication in Zoom with Harvey Hoyer, and that will not impact my voting today. Okay, good. Michael? I have had no ex parte communications. Okay, Kim. None? Okay, Harvey got me too. I had a, a Zoom call with Harvey to, he advocated for their client, will not affect my ability to judge today. We'll move on to item six, so public hearing. Perfect, anyone uh, in the audience today that wants to make comments on any cases today, there's uh, forms to fill out, you can bring them up front, we'll make sure you're heard. Uh, when you do speak, if you're providing any testimony, just come up and use one of these microphones and state your name and address. And anyone who will be presenting or making testimony today, would you please stand and be sworn in? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. All right, thanks. All right, good, we'll start with uh, first case today. We'll do uh, new cases, transfer of development rights, number 23-10. We'll go ahead and... And, and Roger, I'll need to recuse myself from uh, case 23-10. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sorry, may I just have one minute, please? Um, the city attorney, could you please confirm for us whether you know the remaining members up here um, constitute sufficient quorum? A quorum of this board is four members. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Lauren. Uh, transfer development right now. Uh, certificate 23-10, Lauren Thomas, on behalf of Touchstone Web Realty. Uh, this is in regards to 9,995 square feet of TDRs going to Nora's Bank. Uh, sending site is coming from 914 10th Street. Again, 9,995 square feet. You can see where the transfer is being done, and that is it. Okay. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions of the applicant? We'll hear from staff quickly. Perfect. Thank you, Lauren. Good morning, everyone. Chris Kimberly, Urban Design Planner. This is TDR Case 2310. Uh, as Lauren had mentioned, this is going from 914 10th Street to the Nora subdistrict where they will be banking the TDRs. Uh, the banking of TDRs is uh, permitted through uh, Section 94 132 of our zoning and land development regulations. Uh, Nora has not finalized the plans of where these TDRs will be going, so they are being retained within the bank uh, to date. Um, after this transfer, it'll be about uh, 772,000 square feet of TDRs that Nora has banked. Uh, when these are to be transferred to a formal site plan or project, 
um, the uh, DAC will see that application as well and then uh, the transfer as well to the properties. Um, staff finds that the transfer of development rights is in accordance of 94.132 and we recommend approval. Any other okay. questions? Seems pretty straightforward like all the others. Nothing unusual about this one? No. Nope. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Chris. Any comments from anyone in the audience on this case? Seeing none, we'll close public discussion. Any questions from the board members, the staff, or the applicant? Motion? I can make a motion. I move that the Downtown Action Committee approve the transfer of development rights DAC case number TDR 23-10 as listed in the staff report dated February 14th, 2024 as follows. A, the transfer of 9,995 square feet of TDRs from 914 10th Street to Nora East 10-11 owner LLC pursuant to the requirements of section 94-132. Okay, it's a motion or a second? Second. Our second. Second. Motion, second. All in second. Okay. Yes. Um, um, yeah, right? Yeah. And we also said I understand that we can choose the um, I don't think we need to get the rights. Oh, We've okay. got a quorum, so okay. I, I think we're good. Okay. Mo all right. Okay. And motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion. Okay. 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 All right. Oh, you thought you were going to throw in an A just to the All right. But the motion carries. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to the uh, next TDR case 24 01. Um, I guess staff will go ahead and present this one. Yes. This is uh, TDR case 24 01. Uh, this is a request by Gina Baker on behalf of the city's uh, CRA for the transfer of 12,065 square feet of development rights from the properties of 1020 and 1028 North Tamarind Avenue uh, to the CRA's TDR bank. Uh, this project here is uh, nearing completion. Uh, most of the exterior work has been completed now. There's just a couple interior uh, you know, tenant build outs to uh, complete. Um, again, the banking of TDRs is permitted, and the uh, city CRA is purchasing the TDRs to raise funds necessary to complete these interior renovations of the building. Uh, in that regard, the CRA will then bank the TDRs and either sell or utilize them in any other projects that they have. Um, staff again finds that this transfer of development rights is in accordance with section 94.132 and we recommend approval. Okay, thanks. Again, it seems fairly standard, nothing unusual. Um, anyone in the audience have a comment or a question on this project? Seeing none, we'll close public discussion. Any questions from the board for staff? All right, I'm going to make a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that the Downtown Action Committee approve the transfer of development rights, DAC case number TDR 24-01 as listed in the staff report dated February 14th, 2024 as follows. A, the transfer of 12,065 square feet from, of TDRs from 1020-1028 North Tamron Avenue to City of West Palm Beach Community Redevelopment Agency, CRA, TDR Bank pursuant to the requirements of section 94-132. Okay, great. Motion, is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye opposed? No, the motion carries. Great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, that's our TDR cases for today. Item two going down to uh, formal site plan review, case number 23-14. This is a request by Harvey Orr of Schutz and Bowen on behalf of MCM 324 Daytona. Okay. Site plan review. We'll go ahead and hear from the applicant. Mr. Good morning, Orr. everyone. For the morning. record, Harvey Orr of Schutz and Bowen on behalf of the applicant, NYU Langone. I apologize for my attire. I don't have a jacket that will fit over this. Okay. Um, so we are before you uh, with your jurisdiction over variances. This is a site plan that is under 50,000 square feet, so I don't think it would normally uh, come to you. It'd be administratively approved, I believe, but because we are seeking four variances, that invokes your jurisdiction. Uh, let me sort of set the table for what we're going to do here. I'm going to introduce the 
a project, its location, who the applicant is. Uh, then I'm going to allow the design professionals to address you with the site plan, the architecture, the landscape, and then I will come back up and discuss the four variances. So the site location is the southeast corner of Dixie Highway and Daytura Street. Uh, that is currently the atrium building. If you're familiar with it, it's quite an old, I think not even fully occupied office building right for redevelopment. The proposed development plan is a seven story medical office building with almost 77,000 square feet of medical office use. It is four levels of parking below a total of 191 parking spaces with three levels of habitable medical office space above. There are four variances related to this. They are generally described as a conditional side interior setback off of Dixie Highway at the upper levels above 92 feet, a conditional setback from Dixie Highway, a conditional setback for parking uses, and a variance for active use and active use liners on level two and three of the garage. Um, with that, uh, I want to spend a moment talking about who the applicant is and why this is important to our community. Uh, we have hospitals in our community, if you're familiar with them. I, I am, I'm on the board of one of them. Uh, they are the highest rated hospital we have in the city is a two star rated hospital. Um, that's a, a problem that uh, we've had in our community for a long time is lack of great medical care. And so if you have the means, uh, you get on an airplane and go to Boston or New York or Rochester or Cleveland or somewhere else. We're very fortunate that in recent years, no doubt due to the post-COVID migration of folks that we are getting better health care in our community. One of these you're aware of because you approved it a few years ago, the Hospital for Special Surgery, which is in the downtown master plan. Um, number one rated orthopedic hospital in America, I think 30 consecutive years. I've not only got their approval, I've had two surgeries there, uh, including this time last week. So I can speak to how these work. And they are formatted nearly identically. Uh, today's applicant is NYU Langone, and I won't read all of this to you, but you can see that they are five-star rated by CMS, which is the federal rating system for hospitals. So this judges every aspect of a hospital, infection rates, readmission rates, patient satisfaction. Uh, we have no five-star hospitals in Palm Beach County. In fact, I don't think we have a five-star hospital in all of Southeast Florida. With the exception of the not-for-profit Jupiter Medical Center at four stars, every hospital in Palm Beach County is rated either one star or two star, including all three hospitals in the city of West Palm Beach. Uh, this is an enormous opportunity for our community to have a five-star nationally recognized, uh, one of the top medical providers in the nation, as you can see uh, at this top icon, uh, they're rated number one hospital in the nation by one of the rating services and by US News and World Report, 10 of their medical specialties are listed in the top 10 in the United States. This is not a doctor's office that they're opening. This is, has operating rooms, radiology units. This is where the best doctors in America will serve our community in the heart of our downtown. So uh, I want you to be aware of that. And I want you to be aware of the other important aspect of this. This is a business development board codename project because it is a corporate relocation. And the city, this administration, uh, this planning and zoning staff have always been very helpful in uh, expediting uh, corporate relocations and corporate expansions, which is why West Palm Beach is disproportionately the greatest recipient of uh, corporate relocations and expansions compared to the other municipalities in Palm Beach. So just to put some numbers to this, uh, if approved and built, this will be approximately 85 new jobs to our downtown with an average comp of over $135,000. To put that in perspective, the average wage in Palm Beach County is about $60,000 a year. And the average wage in West Palm Beach is a couple thousand dollars more than that. So these are not only new jobs to our downtown that 
involve people with high intellectual capital, which has other value to the community, but it is over double both the city and county wage. So this by far exceeds the standards of the Business Development Board to support a project. And if it was not in your packet, uh, the Business Development Board does endorse this project. So I want you to be aware of how long this has been going on. We've been working on this project. I say we, I just stepped down as the board chair of the Business Development Board. The BDB has been working on this project for two years to not only bring high paying, high intellectual capital jobs to our downtown, but also attempting to plug this longstanding gap in the quality of our medical care in our community. With that, I'm going to pause here. I will be back to discuss the variances, uh, but I'm going to ask Royce DeLord of the Arcadis firm, who is the design architect, to come forward and walk you through the architecture and the landscape architecture. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey. <clears throat> Thank you, Harvey. As, as Harvey mentioned, my name is Royce DeLord, and I'm with Arcadis. And we're the design architects for the corn shell of 324 Datura. All right, I'm gonna start with some just site data. Um, so our gross building area is around 182,500 square feet. Um, of that, the medical office program occupies around 76,682 square feet. Uh, and we have 191 parking spaces. Um, and so for, I'm gonna start with the landscape uh, portions of the project. It was very important for us in working with the landscape architects uh, to focus on the pedestrian experience at the ground level. And so, um, as you can see, there's no public open space requirement for, for the project. Um, however, we are providing some public amenities on the site. Um, and the only requirement as far as landscape goes on this ground floor level is the street trees uh, every 30 feet. Um, so we are providing that, but we're going above and beyond and providing 2,160 square feet of additional landscape space within the property. Um, and so this helps to further enhance that pedestrian experience. Um, and in conjunction, you know, with some architectural features that I'll mention a little later, um, it helps to really bring uh, the building down to the human scale at this level, as well as provide a welcoming atmosphere for the patients and personnel who will be using this building. And so all of the landscape that's located within the property line is of a human scale. It's lower planting. Um, we're also providing some seating areas, um, kind of gathering areas toward the corner. Um, and then we also have this uh, colonnade uh, within the building that kind of acts as a extenuation of the waiting area for, for patients, you know, who are waiting to, to see their physicians. On the roof level, uh, we're meeting the private open space requirements, as well as the tree canopy uh, and landscape area requirements. Um, for the design, we, we pushed a lot of that landscape area toward the edge so that it can be appreciated not only by the occupants of the building, but also can be seen and appreciated from the ground level and from uh, adjacent buildings as well. Uh, there's also a Kind of panel in the middle, a lawn panel uh, that is meant for more communal gathering space uh, within the roof terrace. All right, so architecturally, uh, kind of on a conceptual level, uh, we thought of this building as consisting of two volumes. Um, one volume is oriented toward the northwest of the site. Um, and it's the more public facing volume. And that's what you're seeing on this north elevation. Um, this is the long side of that public facing volume. And it, it's more transparent in nature. Um, it has a curtain wall system uh, that consists of 
the, the glass and also vertical fins that run um, through the office levels, but also continue down through the parking garage. Um, and we'll, I'll get into the assembly of that system a little later, but it really creates a very dynamic facade for this building. Um, we really wanted to, uh, to give the impression of like the clean and sophisticated nature of the client that will be within this, uh, within this building. And so on the edge of this volume, you can see that the fins continue all the way down to the garage. Uh, and that side wraps around to the, to the east facade as well. Um, on the fifth level, we created this recess to kind of break up that volume a little bit um, and create this kind of void space. Um, and then on the parking level, there's um, a separate assembly that we, that continues that fin language uh, but we play with the density and uh, direction of the fins as well as the depth to create more movement on that facade and also uh, block more views into the parking garage. And then the ground floor level is the most transparent. It's the, um, the, the portion that's more visible to the pedestrian walking by. And so we wanted that uh, facade to feel more open. All right, this is the south elevation, and so this is the long side of the more private volume of the building. Um, and this volume, it still has a more a contemporary architectural language, but it's a little different. It's more solid in nature uh, with punched openings um, for the uh, fenestration. And the fenestration pattern um, continues down through the garage where we infill that with a perf perforated metal screen. Um, this volume encapsulates the back of house and loading dock area and also um, shields the mechanical penthouse that's on the roof. So it's a little taller volume than that uh, more public facing volume. So the east and west elevations, uh, you start to see the how that language from the different volumes kind of wraps around. We didn't want it to just end at the corners of the building, but we wanted it to be uh, more three-dimensional. And so this on this facade, we're bordering, we're abutting kind of our neighboring property. Um, and so you can see the, the parking garage portion uh, is very solid, but we've broken it up with some um, architectural features, some recesses, and a changing change of materiality within that recess. Um, and you can see that the, the language from that south facade wraps around, as well as the, um, the more transparent facade wraps around the corner as well. And this is the west facade. This is um, you know, that other uh, facade of that more public facing volume. Uh, you can see the fifth floor, that recess area wraps around the corner. Um, and then we are also bookending uh, the office level with the fins that continue all the way down through the garage. Uh, we really wanted to connect the office levels with the garage portion. And so that fin language um, is what helps to accomplish that. So just a little more information about the two systems that we're using with these fins. So the fins are oriented at a 45 degree angle. Um, and this really helps to create that movement that we'll see uh, in the renderings. And it also on the west facade in particular uh, helps to block a portion of the, uh, of the sun uh, kind of in the afternoon so that the solar heat gain of the office levels um, isn't as much. The fin material uh, is a lighter gray metallic finish and it has some mica in it, which um, depending on how the sun hits it, um, it really has a variety um, you know, of colors that you'd perceive throughout the day. And so on the office level, the spacing of the fins is very consistent. Uh, it's five feet. 
Um, and then as you go down to the, the parking garage levels, we get a little more playful with, with the spacing. Um, it varies between one foot three to two foot six. Um, and this is to help shield views into the parking garage, but also um, it creates a very interesting dynamic pattern along the parking garage facade as well. Um, additionally, instead of glass on this level, we have a perforated aluminum panel that also helps to shield views into the parking garage, uh, as well as help meet uh, the natu naturally ventilated uh, parking requirement that, that we're uh, going for here. Those fins continue down. We play with the, the direction of the fins, as you'll, as you'll see in the renderings. Um, as well as the depth on this level as well. Um, some quick kind of conceptual elevations here. So as you can see, there's, there's quite a bit of distance between our project and um, the project across Dixie Highway, so lay at City Center. Um, and that's because there is a public open space there, a Zen garden. Um, and so there's a lot of breathing room um, around our project. Um, and so you can kind of see that in these elevations as well as this plan here. It's about 125 feet um, of open space um, at the tightest and then that expands uh, even further um, to 220 feet as you move further south um, along Dixie Highway. And so um, here we have a rendering from the corner of Dixie and Datura looking toward the southeast. And this is where you really see that full volume of that uh, public facing volume and that glass and fin facade. And so um, you get that kind of consistent rhythm along the office levels of the fins. And then as you continue down to the parking, um, it gets a little more um, playful and um, you really get to experience the, the movement that the fins create. Um, and something that we really appreciate about this design is that um, you, you'll never experience the same building twice, uh, just depending on the time of year, uh, the weather. Um, it really creates a very dynamic facade that you know, will change on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is uh, the building kind of looking down to Chura Street. You can see the parking garage entrance um, as well as the main lobby entrance that is uh, next to it. Uh, you can see how those uh, volumes kind of are interacting and wrap around each corner um, as well as that kind of recessed portion um, on level five, where we start to expose the columns uh, and, and break up the mass a little bit. So this is uh, on Dixie Highway, kind of looking at the corner of the south and west facade. Um, here you can see that, that solid volume, um, which is a little taller than that uh, more transparent volume, and it kind of peaks out around the corner um, you get a view kind of down the alley a little bit. Uh, that's where all the you know, loading and back of house spaces uh, are located. And we continue that fenestration pattern um, on that volume down into the garage. So this is that public realm of the ground floor that I was speaking to earlier. In addition to the landscape elements, we have uh, this Brie Soleil that wraps around the north portion of the building. Um, and really helps to bring the scale down, um, which is more enjoyable for the pedestrian. Um, in addition to that, the, the scale of the pavers really helps uh, you know, to bring the scale of the building down and bring some warmth um, to this ground floor level, uh, which is more welcoming uh, to, the, to the people that will be using it. In addition to that, um, you can see it a little better in this view uh, we have this, some wood look planks uh, that infill the canopy on the west side of the building, uh, as well as under that colonnade. And one more thing that I wanted to, to hit on before uh, I hand it back over to Harvey is that 
Um, we're creating more circulation paths, you know, that currently don't exist on that site that allow for the pedestrian to, uh, you know, get out of the weather and, um, you know, really protect them from the elements here. So this lower canopy is solid on the west side of the building, um, but transitions to a brief soleil on the north, which allows the light to, to really get into that colonnade element. Um, as well as filter down to the landscape. Um, so, yeah, we, we're really excited about this building. We, we hope you all are too. And, um, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free. Oh, great. Yeah, nice presentation. Thanks. Um, unless there's any urgent questions, we'll save questions for later. Yeah, perfect. All right, great. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks. Thank you. So that was the fun part. Now on to the mundane part. Uh, and incidentally, uh, this part of it we're showing you out of courtesy. Um, it's, it's not actually a, a special review by you if you're only voting on the variances, but we thought the context of the building, the design philosophy, what it is we're trying to accomplish is an important part of your decision-making process on the variances. And of course, we're delighted to take your feedback on the architecture. Um, just want to be clear that the jurisdiction today is invoked solely because of the four variances. Okay, we have four variances, and I've sort of uh, lumped them together because they're related. I'm going to spend more time on variance one and variance two, uh, predominantly because those are the ones that staff has a neutral recommendation on. Uh, I will lump together variances three and four and not spend much time on those not only because staff is recommending approval, but for those of you that have been on the board for a while, you know the most common variants granted uh, by this board for projects in downtown are uh, three and four. And so um, those are fairly routine. So let's spend most of our time on variances one and two. So variance one is uh, a portion of the code that requires a conditional setback on the east facade. So uh, on the left, you'll see we are, can have a zero foot setback. If we have a blank fire rated wall up against our neighbor to the east. Uh, but if we want to move it in, we have to move it in 20 feet. And we're only moving it in 15 feet, which is what triggers the variance. So again, if it was zero feet on the property line, or if it was inset 20 feet, not a variance. If you inset it anything different than 20 feet, it is a variance. Why are we insetting it? Because those are our occupied habitable floors above the garage. We would like them to have windows and light. Assuming the property to the east of us ever gets redeveloped, we'd like to put some breathing room and space between our project and their project but we would have to have a fire rated wall if we were any closer than 15 feet. So one of the requirements for a variance is that it's the minimum needed to accomplish your objective. And 15 feet is the minimum fire separation. So that is why it's 15 feet. Um, and I'll let staff speak for uh, their position, but I think their non-approval recommendation on this doesn't tie to the fact that we're trying to put breathing room and light and meet the fire code. It probably has to do with an issue that I'm going to come to on variance number two, which is can you break up the larger floor on seven and move it to eight and utilize this space with a zero foot setback. A zero foot setback would not accomplish the other goals that I just stated, which provide breathing room and light to our project but also the future redevelopment of the project to the east so you don't have two party walls against each other. Now this is a little bit difficult to see in the rendering. I wish the tree could be pulled out of the rendering, but the area in the red box is the area that we are requesting the variance. And that is inset 15 feet. And if that tree canopy were not in the way, you could see that it is inset 15 feet further westward than the parking garage wall. The alternative, of course, would be to have a 104 foot blank wall on that east facade. 
which at the moment probably doesn't uh, materially harm the neighbor to the east. But going forward in the future, that is probably not the look that we would want to have either for our project or for our neighboring project. Thus, the request for the variance. Now, for the second variance, which I'll spend more time on, and it's related to the first variance, I want to first point out something that Royce alluded to. Um, we're uniquely blessed with an enormous separation from our neighbor to the west. And the second variance is a conditional upper story setback above 92 feet that requires a wedding cake step back above 92 feet or seven stories. Uh, we do not exceed seven stories, so we meet that criteria, but we're exceeding 92 feet, and I'm going to explain why we exceed 92 feet, and it is due to the unique nature of this use. Um, but before I do that, I want to just contextually point out that the purpose for an upper story setback, as you well know, is to protect the public and your neighbor from an overwhelming mass of a tall building that goes straight up in the air. In this case, we are fortunate that we not only have a 16-foot setback off the Dixie Highway right-of-way, we then have Dixie Highway, but then we have the large mandatory public open space of the Soleil project, which I don't think is going to be redeveloped anytime soon. We just approved it eight or nine years ago, so it's a relatively new building and their public open space, which is a Zen garden, as Royce alluded to, provides an enormous buffer that far exceeds the 62 feet uh, that the code contemplates for protecting the public or your neighbor on that upper story setback. In fact, it's more than double that. The nearest building face is 125 feet away uh, from the wall, our western wall. So that's just context. Let's talk about the detail of it. So what I've Try to provide here on the right is a typical traditional office building contemplated by our downtown master plan and on the left is the applicant's proposed project. So the code uh, requires the upper story conditional wedding cake uh, setback above the seventh floor if we were going more than seven floors. We are not going more than seven floors and incidentally in this zoning district you can have 10 stories by right. So we're three stories below what the code allows. Uh, we're not exceeding seven stories, but we are exceeding the 92 feet. Now, you're probably asking yourself, why can you not fit a seven-story building in 92 feet? You most certainly could do that if we were building apartments, condominiums, a hotel, a general office building, all of which the DMP contemplated. But what our DMP never did contemplate is the unique use that you have before you this morning. And I know that because I sat on the committee 15 years ago that drafted the current DMP, and no one ever foresaw that we would have Brightline and you know, BlackRock and Goldman Sachs and HSS and NYU Langone. You know, we were kind of a small podunk town for all of our existence, and none of us ever saw uh, what has uh, the enormous opportunities that have arrived on our doorstep. So our code never contemplated the floor-to-floor -floor heights that I'm about to describe to you. But the code did contemplate flexibility and that there would be something unforeseen that we couldn't think of 15 years ago that we would want our code to be able to adapt to. And that's why there's a variance process. And that's exactly why we are before you today. So why do we have an additional height need? On the left side, you'll see orange lines, and those orange lines are the additional floor-to-floor -floor required for this unique use. Every one of the three habitable floors have a much larger floor-to-floor uh, -floor height than a general office building because of the unique use of the building. And when you add up the additional floor-to-floor -floor space, it turns out to be 15 feet greater than a normal law office, CPA office, um, restaurant, vape shop, medical marijuana store, all the things that we put in the downtown. Um, uh, we require additional mechanical uh, and electrical runs. Uh, and 
if we did not have that 15 feet, you can see the delta between 92 feet, which is what triggers this, and our actual 106 feet. The delta is 14 feet. So if we did not have the uh, unique use that we were proposing, we would not trigger this variance. Now, what is it exactly that is occurring uh, in our floors that require them to be 14, 15, and 18 feet in height instead of the traditional 10 feet in height? And I won't read to you, uh, but I will uh, point some of these out to you. Uh, the slab requirements on a radiology floor where you place very heavy MRI, CAT scan, PET scan, X-ray machines, those are very heavy machines. They need a stronger support system. They also need a support system that has absolutely zero vibration in them. Uh, if you have even the slightest vibration in a CAT scan or an MRI, it ruins the imagery. So it's a different construction type. You also have significantly more mechanical in the ceiling. So in my office building, we exchange our air about four times an hour. Uh, a hospital, by accreditation standards and best management practices in their industry, they need to change their air 20 times an hour or more so that they keep it clean, germ-free. They have to segregate it from the operating room next door. They have to segregate it from the floor beneath it and the floor above it. Well, that doubles or triples the amount of mechanical space in the ceiling. They also, in the operating rooms, have lighting systems, boom systems, uh, you know, surgical equipment that is very tall, uh, so it needs a higher floor to ceiling, not just floor to floor. There are various gas canisters in the ceiling. Uh, I uh, will allow you to read this, and we have our entire professional team here. They can stand up and tell you in greater detail, but suffice it to say, you cannot have an accredited hospital facility with radiological units and with operating rooms without the mechanical, electrical, and medical equipment that I'm describing to you. So if we choose not to grant the variances, you are choosing to not have this facility here. So let's walk through these. Uh, the habitable floors are level five, level six, and level seven. And you can see on the right that there is a nine foot floor to ceiling. That's a typical height. But then there's an additional six feet above the ceiling that you do not see with these more extraordinary mechanical runs, gas canisters, all of the things that I described. So that means level five is a total of 15 feet, five more feet than a typical general office building would require. Level six is even higher. It is 10 feet plus eight feet, 18 feet, so eight feet higher than a general office building. Level seven is 15 feet again, nine foot floor to ceiling, uh, six feet of mechanical and other equipment in the ceiling that you do not see. And this is in addition to the doubling of the slab for the structural support and the vibration canceling that is needed for the imaging equipment on the radiological floor. Um, let's talk about the other aspect of this because staff uh, said, okay, you're allowed 10 stories, you're only using seven. Why don't you simply comply with the conditional setback above 92 feet and build an eighth floor? And that's the other part of this equation that does not work for this type of use. The adjacency requirements of having these uses co-located together is non-negotiable. Uh, you cannot break these up. Let me give you an example. So the radiology floor, all of the radiological equipment needs to be side by side. When you come in, and I've done this a couple of times in the last few weeks, you go into the changing room, you put on that paper gown that leaves you half naked, and you then go immediately out of the changing room into an MRI, and you may then go to a CAT scan, and you may then go to an ultrasound, and you may then go to an X-ray, uh, and all of those people, the radiologists, the people behind the, the glass that tell you, turn your head left, turn your head right, hold your breath, 
They have to be able to look at you. They have to be able to give you instructions. You cannot do that, folks, from multiple floors. For the dignity and privacy of our clients, even if this was not a, an accreditation issue, we're not going to put our clients in a paper gown half naked and say, go up and down the elevator to get to the next machine. And then we'll send you up and down the elevator again to get to your next machine. That's not how a first class, white glove, five star rated, number one hospital in America operates. It is not how HSS operates. Uh, and you approved HSS with an identical floor plan or nearly identical. So that's the radiological floor. It's even more significant on the operating floor. Uh, when you go in for one of these outpatient surgeries, which again, I did last Tuesday, you are in a pre-op area, they wash you up, they make you clean and sanitary, an anesthesiologist comes in and starts to administer drugs to you to make you unconscious, and they then wheel you into an operating room. They don't wheel you into an elevator to a different floor to an operating room. Uh, when you're done with your surgery and you're unconscious, they don't bang you through stairwells and down hallways and up and down elevators to get you to a post-op recovery. That is just not done in a hospital setting. When the doctors and the nurses, the surgical team, are cleaning themselves and making themselves sanitary, they do not then get in an elevator uh, touch dirty air that's in a different mechanical system, press an elevator button, and go to a different floor to perform surgery. All of this needs seamless adjacency. And the only way you can accomplish that on this size property with this floor plate is to use an entire floor. You cannot break these up and move them to a different floor. So without the variance, this project does not occur, which I think the public would find disappointing that we found a way to have a dozen medical marijuana and vape shops in our downtown, but we can't get the number one rated hospital in America in our downtown. So I think you see the gravity and significance of this. It's not as easy as taking my law office or Roger's architecture office and saying move half the lawyers or half the architects to the next floor. Now, I am not capable of explaining what every one of these rooms do. Our team can but this represents that adjacency requirement on all of the floors. And it also holds true on the floor where the doctors have their examination rooms because many of these patients come in to be examined by one type of doctor and in their gown they go next door to be examined by a different type of doctor or nurse or be tested or have blood drawn or whatever they are doing and putting them on elevators to go up and down a facility is not hygienic, it doesn't meet accreditation standards, best management practices, and it's simply not good business. And again, if you'd like to come back to these, I will have a better qualified person explain to you what is occurring in each of these rooms. But that is the high level explanation of what is going on. So let me recap variances one and two. While it is theoretically possible to do what staff has recommended, which is not have a 15 foot setback on the east side of the building. You could have a blank fire rated wall that will look like a blank fire rated wall from ground to 104 feet in the air. It'd actually be higher because you'd have to create a partial eighth floor. We would not be doing the public a favor. We would not be doing our customers a favor and we would not be doing our neighbor to the east a favor. And while you theoretically could chop off half of the seventh floor and move it up to the eighth floor, uh, and while you Langone would not build and operate this, no accrediting agency would accredit it, and we would not have this facility. So um, the general office requirements do not apply. Are we in danger of setting a precedent we don't wanna live with? Not in my mind, not at all. Because unless you can demonstrate a unique need that requires a variance for this setback requirement, this board shouldn't grant it to anyone else. So if I bring to you a hotel, an apartment, a general office building, and I say, hey, you granted NYU Langone this upper story setback, you should grant it to me. Unless I can demonstrate to you the unique need that requires it, you would deny that. So we are not opening Pandora's box. Now, 
if John Hopkins uh, and uh, Dana Farber wanted to build a similar facility and bring more five-star medical care to our downtown and they ha have the identical problem, you should absolutely grant that variance. That would be wonderful. We should roll out the red carpet for them. But I think in the general context of our code, you are not setting a precedent that the city and you and the staff cannot live with. I think that is an unfounded fear. Now, I'm gonna quickly skip through variances three and four because this is the most commonly granted variance. Uh, and that is because when Henry Flagler platted the town of West Palm Beach, it was a town then, not a city, in 1894, we created in our downtown lots that are 140 feet deep. And if you overlay the dimensional requirements of the setback uh, that is required, the uh, drive aisle width that is required by the code, uh, the fire separation and firewalls that are required by state statute, the parking stall length and depth that is required by code, there is simply not enough real estate on any property in the downtown to build a functional parking garage. And you would have very small and efficient garages that are not double loaded, and you would have to make a parking garage twice as tall. And instead of uh, four stories of parking garage, we would have seven stories of parking garage, uh, and then three stories of habitable use on top of it. You all recognize this, you disfavor um, unnecessary parking garage, so you have granted these variances at least a dozen times on, on projects that I've worked on and probably multiples of that. So let me just tell you what this coloration is. The red coloration uh, is a conditional setback uh, that is required above the third floor or 44 feet for parking. And we are seeking above 44 feet to continue parking the garage Otherwise, the circulation in a legal parking garage does not work. And then behind that setback, there is also an active use liner requirement that for 20 feet of depth, you must have some human activity occurring there. And if you were to subtract the red and the purple from the parking garage, the parking garage does not work at all. In fact, you'd have to move the core of the building, which then means it wouldn't work for the three habitable floors. So it would have this domino effect of the building wouldn't work, not just for our use, but for any use. So whether it's NYU Langone in front of you with this request or any other project uh, that has been brought before you, it wouldn't work for anyone. And this is no developer's fault. It's no property owner's fault. It's simply the way our town is platted with 140 foot deep lots. And you have always made the active choice to make a functional legal parking garage where parking spaces are large enough for cars and drive aisles are wide enough for cars to pass each other and site visibility angles and turning radii are sufficient. Uh, and what you have done to um, make up for that or mitigate for that is architectural treatment on the outside. So even though you may not have an active use of human beings behind the window, you have allowed fenestration, vertical wall gardens, architectural treatment such as what has been provided to you this morning to mitigate for the fact that you do not have the setback and you do not have the active use behind it. So uh, that, those are variances number three and four this graphically illustrates where uh, one of those would occur. Your standards of review for, for today on all four variances are found in section 94-38D6 of your code. We believe we comply with all of these. I'm delighted to go through each of these individually if you would like me to, uh, to provide the justification, a lot of which I think I've already explained to you but in the interest of everyone's time, unless you have a particular question, um, I won't go through those. Uh, and again, our request today is approval of the four variances. Mr. Chair, thank you for the time and the opportunity to present what I think is an exciting, game-changing project for our downtown, and our entire professional team is here to answer any question that you may have. Great, thank you, nice presentation. Any, any immediate questions or wait till later for questions? Let's do that. Great. Thank you. And uh, we'll hear Thank from you. the staff. Thanks, Harvey.
Good morning, everyone. Chris Kimberly, Urban Design Planner. Uh, this is for formal site plan 2314, 324 Daytura Street. Uh, this is just for variance requests uh, before that Harvey had mentioned there. Again, the first being a reduction on the conditional side interior. Uh, the second being a reduction on a conditional setback above seven stories or 92 feet. A request for the reduction on the conditional parking setbacks uh, above the third story and the percentage of active uses and liner depths on stories two and three. Uh, in general, uh, I would like to say that, again, city staff does support the overall project and recognizes that this is a unique use and development within the downtown. Um, as it applies to the variance requests in particular, city staff has no objection to variance requests three and four as they do meet all 10 standards uh, of our variance standards. However, staff does have concerns uh, with variances one and two. Um, again, staff believes there are some design alternatives uh, that may eliminate the need for these requests. Um, staff is concerned with the precedent being set for other commercial uses within the DMP, uh, and staff is uh, hesitant to say that all uh, 10 variant standards are met with the um, petition. So going into, again, the variant standards is just a dimensional or numerical relief um, on the project. These are the uh, variant standards outlined here. And delving into variance request number one, uh, again, this is Chris, for- sorry, can you go back a, a slide? I just want to bring to the board's attention, these are the standards that you're going to be considering for this variance grant. So just look at these um these are again the criteria you need to consider in in uh you know in weighing whether you should grant this variance or not that's all i just want to bring it to your attention while it was up okay um, i have a question on this topic so the applicant um had the chart where you ticked all the box where all the criteria are met and then the staff is saying some of these criteria are not met Right. Do we have a comparison of where the, uh, the criteria, where the staff and applicant differ? Yeah, I'll, I'll be so, yeah, that so, so we narrow in the, on those instead of going down to this very long yeah, list. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Um, so regarding variance number one, again, this is the request to reduce the required setback um, for a side interior uh, above a fifth story from 20 feet to 15 as the project's proposing. Uh, again, the zero, uh, zero setback, zero foot setback on the property line is only for um, the lower levels uh, and as well as when you are above the fifth story, if your lot is narrower, uh, we allow you again to build to a zero lot line. Um, but again, typically this conditional setback is to kind of step in your building as you grow up in height. Um, variance two, again, is the request to reduce the required setback uh, by 46 feet on the Dixie frontage where a 62 foot conditional setback is required above 92 feet or the seventh story. Again, the intention of the upper story setbacks is really to condense the project as you build up in height. We really want to consolidate the mass. We want to protect, protect the adjacent rights of way, uh, the public realm and the neighbors. And we want to reduce the visual and spatial impact of a large, massive building. Um, again, and we want to balance and frame the right of way uh, and that public corridor. Uh, you'll note here that in section 94118, the Quadro Garden District, which this project is within, uh, the intent of the district uh, states there that de development should respect the scale of the pedestrian streets, Dixie Highway, and Olive Avenue in particular. Um, so looking graphically at what these variance requests are, we see here the boxed in areas in red. So on the left there, that is variance one. This is for the additional five feet needed to meet the 20 foot interior setback. And then variance two there is on the right where you'll see the mass there that uh, encroaches into that 62 foot uh, setback. And then looking at a plan view again, this is the square footage we're talking about interior to the building itself. 
Uh, so harping on the topic of the design alternatives, uh, staff believes that there are potential design alternatives for this project as the Quadro Garden District does permit 10 stories or 128 feet with an FAR of 2.75. Uh, this subject property and project tops out at seven stories or 106 feet and has an FAR of 2.72. Yeah, uh, so this leaves hypothetically three stories, uh, but in reality, 22 feet of height to play with and an additional 1,100 square feet of unutilized development capacity. If we were to take this square footage highlighted here in red uh, and as well as here for all the other stories uh, and we add that up we get approximately 8,300 square feet of additional floor um, that's encroaching or that could be utilized elsewhere so again staff believes that perhaps this could be within a eighth story uh, as there's the height to play with with an eighth story uh, additionally um, while the project does meet its parking minimums its minimum parking is 158 spaces uh, the applicants providing 191 uh, so there is a, an abundance of about 33 spaces. Um, their lowest parking level, I think, has 38 spaces in particular. So even a reduction perhaps in parking may allow or allocate additional space for uh, storage or other um, uses that take up FAR and that may allow a stepping back in some of the massing on the upper level. Yes. Um. Can you explain a little bit more on that previous slide, how that would solve the variance issues? Yes, so with uh, taking the encroaching square footage highlighted in red and placing it in an upper story, so if you can see my mouse here, so uh, an upper story, this area in blue is approximately 12,000 square feet. Uh, so uh, 8,000 square feet, again, is maybe cutting in, in half here, lopping off a portion of it, and you would have a, a fully code compliant uh, level that would meet these setbacks. Uh, and again, with the parking reduction, if we were to eliminate a portion or a parking level, again, not a full level could be eliminated, but portions of that, uh, perhaps the building then can step down into the parking level here rather than uh, encroach in the upper portion up there. Uh, the second point that staff has concerns with in variances one and two, again, is a concern with setting a precedent. So within the downtown master plan, um, there is only two classifications of use. You are either a residential use or a commercial use. Um, there's subcategories of that. However, the overarching concept is that commercial uses are grouped together, hotels, offices, restaurants, um, you know, medical office would all fall under this commercial category. Um, and while this proposal, uh, the applicant's proposal for a variance does make sense to maybe this particularly unique and niche use that we're not used to seeing within the downtown, uh, the concern is that if a traditional office or hotel or some other use came in within this district uh, and referenced this project or the granting of the variance uh, in a same uh, concept of providing more efficient, more um, spacious, you know, more operationally sound floor plate for their um, proposal, would we grant the same thing if it's not a medical office? And that, that is the concern there with that. Um, and then going into variances three and four, uh, again, these are our standard variances that we see quite often for parking structures. Um, for this parking structure in particular, it's reduction of the um, entire conditional setback, as well as the elimination of the active use liners. Uh, and this is more so a matter of site constraints, the area again highlighted in red there shows that in order to provide a double loaded corridor with uh, code compliant ramps and drive aisles and spaces, uh, the site is just too narrow to really restrict it anymore without allowing for additional height uh, for parking. Uh, again, this project already has four levels of parking to, to the three levels of office, so we don't want to uh, encourage more of that parking use. Again, this is looking at the renders conceptually. 
Uh, and the intention behind the parking setbacks uh, for these levels, again, is to reduce the visual impact of parking. We want to hide these uses um, that are non-active, so any mechanical, electrical, back of house areas and parking, uh, we ask that you know it is lined with a use that promotes activity, gives sight lines in and into and out of the project, um, and it, it confirms that urban vibrancy that we seek within the downtown. Uh, staff is fully supportive of variances three and four. Again, site constraints requires a minimum parking ratio, and the structure is compliant with that. Um, and the project itself does provide continuous fenestration patterns, uh, has the glazing, has the uh, aluminum mesh panels and the aluminum fins that do provide that architectural treatment uh, and screening of the parking uses. Uh, again, in summary, on the variance recommendation itself, planning staff is purely looking through an objective lens and a strict interpretation of the code and the variance standards, which is why staff is apprehensive for variances one and two. Uh, again, however, staff does recognize that this medical office project is unique. It is a unique use and program that we're not used to seeing within the downtown, uh, and this may result in a condition or a building footprint that we're not used to seeing. Um, and as such, perhaps the code uh, does have some flexibility or allow for that applicability uh, to deviate. And staff, therefore, is deferring uh, support of variances one and two to the board to make the final decision on that. Um, but as was noted in the staff report, we are not supporting the variances for one and two. Um, public notice again here. Uh, this was sent to all property owners within 500 feet of the project. We did not receive any additional public comment. And are there any questions? Yeah, great. Nice presentation. Two quick questions. What, where did this stand in the procedure, the big picture? Has it been to any other review boards, this case? No, so this is just for variances. Uh, as Harvey had mentioned before, it's below our thresholds for special review. So, it has so this would be an administrative approval okay. outside of the, the variance requests. Okay. And then just a quick clarification on the story and height issue. Does, does the code specify a maximum height per story? or Because I think you said seven feet is, or seven stories is 92 feet and 10 stories is, is 128 feet. Is that just a multiplier times? Yeah, so when the DMP was uh, initially drafted, uh, I believe for most of the districts, what we looked at was a standard Floor to ceiling for a office is about 14 feet, 12 to 14 feet. Uh, residential would be about 10, uh, 10 feet. And so those numbers were then multiplied by the, the, the overall district height that was determined. A floor to floor or? A yeah, floor to floor. 14, floor to floor. the ceiling. Uh, is so maybe I'm confused then. So for the seven, the seven story that you described, is that the 92 feet that's, that's listed here? Yeah, so at uh, story seven or 92 feet, whichever is less. So we don't dictate how high you make your floors, uh, but we, we do set a maximum or a minimum threshold there for that. But if I did the math on that, that would be, that would be 1470. That's, that's less, that's more like 1270. Yeah, that's more like 12 feet, right? Yeah. So, so I'm saying, I, what, what's the, the variance is it? So I understand the setback after the 92 feet increases it, but would it be not a variance for the floor to floor height versus the, or is the 92 feet the dictate based on the overall cap versus the story heights? Without, so conf without the confusing 90, the matter, I'm just a little confused on yeah, the Yeah, so right. at the 92 feet point here, or this story here, again, it's 92 feet or seventh story, whichever is less. So they hit the 92 feet threshold first. So their seven story has to step back 62 feet is what the, the code requires. So any upper story above that 92 foot threshold would have to step inward. Yeah, so that's somewhere around 13 and change per floor to floor. Oh yeah. All right, I get it. All right, is anybody, um, any other questions right now, staff, or let's see if we have any public comment and then we'll come back and we'll do it. Okay, real quick. Thank you. Yeah, so that concludes it? staff's presentation? Yes. Okay. Um, do we have any comments from anyone in the audience? Any questions? Um, seeing none, we'll close the public discussion and we'll open Mr. Up. Chair, do I have an opportunity for a rebuttal, please? Sure. Okay. Because I think the question was, is what elements, uh, what standards, your question, if I can rephrase it, what standards do we disagree on? 
and I did not hear staff articulate any particular standard that we disagree on. What I heard him say is they have a concern about setting a precedent, which I clearly addressed in my presentation, that this would not be precedent setting for any other use other than a use that would have similar justifiable hardships and reasons. So I'm still failing to understand how the staff doesn't believe that we meet the criteria in the code. I have introduced evidence both in the written application and in the testimony today how we meet all of those standards. It was not in the staff report how we do not other than they think they it could theoretically be redesigned. I didn't know that they're in the design business, they're in the review business. We have spent three months trying to redesign it to comply with the code so we wouldn't have to come here at all. But it cannot be done. You cannot nip and tuck different parts of the building and glue it all together on an eighth floor and put a 2,000 square foot uh, core that runs right up in the middle of the building and have any functional usable space on the top floor. Putting aside putting half naked people in paper gowns and surgeons up and down elevators, it just doesn't physically work. I think and I've heard no evidence to the contrary. Um, if I may ask counsel for the city, um, I, Chris, yeah, I may want to staff any particulars we could hear that. Yeah, I think um, staff is looking at 6C, which is that it would grant a variance, it would grant a special privilege that other buildings may not be. HSS. Okay, I, I will find the other, and I didn't know the city attorney was an advocate here. I'm I thought not an we, advocate. I I'm thought discussing answering staff. questions. Chris, do you want to? There are that? ample other ones. Thank you, Harvey. We'll let staff go ahead and, and uh, specify which items they had concern with on the variance standards. Chris, I think he's specifically referring to the uh, variance criteria and subsection. Yeah, the variance criteria that you said there was a. Okay, so there we these, go. these are as part of the uh, staff's staff report. Uh, we elaborate further into this, but I can um, note our reasons for the non-compliance. So of the 10 standards there, we outlined five that, uh, again, we have questions to if the uh, petition does fully meet the standards. So starting with the actions of the applicant B, uh, regarding variances one and two, uh, staff believes because there is underutilized height or unutilized height and FAR and development capacity, uh, we could result in a code, fully code compliant structure. Um, again, the dictation of the floor plate design uh, is, is in a sense it's a self-imposed condition. I understand that the medical use is unique in that, um, but we do not dictate floor plates. Um, and going to uh, section C there, special privileges. Uh, this is where we mentioned the precedent being set. Um, again, the applicability of this is a commercial use. Uh, we do not break out these uses. Uh, a medical office is uh, not separated in the code, objectively speaking, uh, any differently than hotel or other office space. Um, so this request could converge or confer a special privilege or an interpretation that is not uh, granted or supported for other uses within that category. Um, D, the literal interpretation. Again, uh, we are not depriving the applicant of rights to build this project. We are merely asking for a redesign as again, there is uh, parking, height, FAR, floor space that could be allocated, perhaps not for specific uh, you know, medical procedural rooms. It could be storage, it could be uh, ancillary uses, reducing some of the corridors, things like that, where we maybe aren't asking for the full uh, 46 feet requirement, but, uh, you know, reducing that in any capacity. Um, F, uh, this is in terms of the comprehensive plan. Uh, again, this is, it's not an egregious uh, step away from, uh, or departure from the comprehensive plan. The only reason we bring this mention up is again the quadrille garden district's intent within the comp plan and within the DMP regulations itself says to scale projects down to the pedestrian streets 
including and calling out specifically Olive and South Dixie. Um, so this project does not step down toward that street. It it's maintains its full mass uh, and is asking for almost 50 feet of um, relief on that frontage. And, and then lastly, uh, reasonable use. Um, I, again, this is just reiterating the same points. There's still uh, FAR height, potential redesign elements, which would still give this property a reasonable use uh, and a reasonable means to develop. Um, and that is where staff explains in the staff report a little bit more uh, where the um, project or petition does deviate from these variant standards. Okay, good, thank you. I respectfully disagree. Um, I don't know how the staff says that we don't comply with the standards where you see the red X's on variances one and two, but we do on three and four. If you follow the staff's logic, we could build a parking garage that complies with active use requirements and the setbacks. It's just we would have a six or seven story parking garage that doesn't function well for the public. And uh, your role as the DAC is to be the adult in the room. So when the staff gets wrapped around the axle and deep in the weeds on looking at the code and not what's in the best interest of the downtown, your role is to make these determinations. So that is why we are here this morning. So if that's the logic you're going to follow, you need to deny variances three and four as well, because those are theoretically possible. You could build a really tall, ugly parking garage that's completely dysfunctional, or you could allow them to violate the uh, drive aisle width, parking stall width, parking stall length, turning radii, site visibility angles, and make an unsafe, unworkable parking garage, which is effectively what staff is asking you to do on the habitable space. Yes, it's theoretically possible to put a surgeon in an elevator to go upstairs to operate on someone and put the patient in the elevator when they're unconscious to go to a different post-op floor. But it makes no sense, just like it makes no sense to have a parking stall that doesn't meet code or a drive aisle that doesn't meet code or no site visibility angle in a parking garage. So you can't have it both ways. If you want to strictly enforce the code, then you have to deny all four variances and you have to go back and deny variances three and four on nearly every other project that you've ever approved in the downtown. The reason you have a variance process is so that you can take your head away from the tree and look at the forest and determine what is in the best interest of the downtown. And that is what we are asking you to do. You have the absolute authority to do it, and you have just as much justification in the record to grant variances one and two as you do variances three and four. Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, so we've heard from applicant staff, no public comment, public comments closed. So why don't we go ahead and have a discussion amongst the board, any specific questions to the staff or the applicant? I think, great presentation. I think it's a beautiful project. and. You know, I think we all know, because we've done this before, we understand the variance process, the need for it. Um, we understand code. If there's any questions in general about that portion, the technical side, you can ha ask uh, staff or, or legal counsel about any of the particulars there. But I think we understand our charge as sort of the overseers of the DMP, the intent of the DMP, and uh, our role to, again, encourage good architecture, good development in the downtown. So. Who wants to speak up? Uh, um, the quick question I have yeah, is, Gregory, uh, is the process. Uh, I know this project is not for the architecture, it's just for the variance, but it, it just bothered me a little bit. We have this far to a crucial moment that they're putting the deck on the decision pro to make the decision on the variance, which is fine, but during the pre-application pro during the pre-application pre uh, process and I'm not sure when and how this wasn't even resolved, where they invest all the time and efforts, then we now we have this project, now we are the tiebreaker to have it move forward. I just wanna get some clarification whether it's something that needs to be addressed so we can lessen the process of friction when there's so much gap between uh, developers and, and staff where we're not putting staff at the bad, uh, 
position to make those calls. So how can we fix that? That's my first uh, kind of question for clarification here. Yeah, so I, I can touch on this briefly. So uh, the, when the project came in within October of last year, um, this was a concern brought up from the uh, initial application, the initial submittal of the plans uh, was the uh, request for variances on the upper story. Um, again, conversations and reviews at that time were looking at alternatives and fenestration patterns, reduction in corridors on the upper levels. Uh, you know, the discussion very much steered toward what can be done to minimize the request of the variance, not for the uh, full 60 or 46 feet, but is there any way to get 15 more feet off of that, 20 more feet, something uh, to that extent. Uh, within the subsequent resubmittals, um, you know, the conversation was, again, what you've heard today, that operationally the floors of the, the building require this for the medical use. Again, it is a niche use. Um, and so uh, I, I, as staff and as a reviewer, had often asked for uh, increased justification, uh, giving the demonstration of why that need and variance was there, um, but the design never changed. And that was also often a repeated comment, was just noting that staff has concerns with variance requests one and two. Um, three and four, again, are variances that we find are just simply due to the site constraints and minimum requirements of the code for parking. So it is often uh, a variance that is content or contentious and uh, contradictory to the code. Um, but one and two was always pointed out from the, the project's inception of being a concern for staff. Yeah. And, and in terms of rest of the process, so this project did go through PPRC, our internal plans plats review committee. So engineering, traffic, uh, zoning, everyone has looked at this um, and deemed the project ready to go here for variance requests. Um, it is an administrative approval, so should you grant these variances, um, the, the project will you know, have their final resubmittal with any changes or anything they need to do, and then um, staff will be issuing a site plan approval letter. And then they can proceed to building permit. Yeah, okay. I, I also have a, a <coughs> question. Um, just in terms of the redesign that's, that's been requested by staff, is that something that's at risk of the five-star designation from a medical institution? If we were to redesign it to eight stories, it sounded like from the applicant um, that, that it was sort of an all, all or nothing and that we potentially would lose the project. Just trying to understand that a bit better. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the, the five-star rating for the medical office, so I will defer to the applicant if they have any. Excellent question. So it doesn't affect the rating. The rating is how a hospital is rated on patient outcomes, infection rates, readmission rates, a whole bunch of criteria. What it is dictated by is accreditation and best management practices in the industry. So hospitals being a regulated industry, um, there are certain things you can and cannot do uh, and you lose your accreditation or ability to operate. So if we do not have this as designed, it doesn't get accredited, so it can't function. So it's not really how it's rated on the back end, it's not built on the front end. Did that answer your question? Yes, that does, thank you. Thank you. I, if I have asked a question? Uh, oh, yeah, thank you. Mr. Or, Greg, were you done? Um, if in fact you do build out, I'm sorry, yeah. build out on the east side, um, or we otherwise, uh, approve variance number one have you factored in then if we denied variance number two could there could the building be functional I I'm probably not the best one to answer that but I know we've spent three months since we met with staff I know staff just said we made no changes that doesn't mean we didn't try making changes that's what we burned 90 or 100 days doing is trying to figure out a way to placate them so that we could have their recommendation for approval but it physically cannot be done for the reasons that I have stated. You cannot cut little, you know, trim little pieces off of different sides of the building and glue it all together on a partial eighth floor and ram through the middle of it a 2,000 foot uh, core with, it. so also consider how much more mechanical equipment you need on a roof. If you are tripling the air and electric inside how much more mechanical do you have on the roof? 
So when you start to do the math on whether it's physically possible to build this, putting aside for a moment whether it's smart to build it, whether they would build it, whether a patient would use it, whether an accrediting agency would accredit it, you can't physically do it. And we did try to do that. And we've tried to explain it to staff for whatever reason that, you know, there's a panic button that was hit that we are going to cause a domino effect of uh, buildings asking for the same treatment. And they would have to prove on a case-by-case -case basis to you that there is some compelling reason why they cannot comply with code. And I have given you the compelling reasons, both in the written application and in the testimony, what our compelling reasons are. And all I'm hearing is we're scared of a precedent. I'm worried about the pedestrian experience. Let me tell you, the pedestrian isn't going to experience anything different between a 92-foot building and a 104-foot building when they walk down the street. They simply cannot perceive the difference, which is why we spent a great deal of time on the architecture so it doesn't look like a parking garage, breaking it up so it looks different every time of the day, every season of the year. It looks different when light hits it differently. I mean, we've done everything we can conceivably do to mitigate this. So you are left with the decision, would you like to have this in the downtown or do you not want to have it in the downtown? Okay, so I, specifically, have you tried a, a proposal where you're building out to the east side property line like you're saying you can do, um, but you then would have to build the eighth story? You'd still have to build it. Right, and right. It still would it be wouldn't functional? Work. So adding 15 feet back to the east side of the building doesn't solve this problem. Okay, I, I wanted to just get your view on that. And by the way, one of the standards of review for a variance is, is it injurious to the public? I would argue that building a hundred and what would then have to be a hundred and twenty foot tall building with a blank white wall with no fenestration on it is more injurious to the public than indenting the building, making it seven stories, putting fenestration on it. That's better for the public. It's our, better for our neighbor. We've weighed all of this. We've hired lots of experts and spent lots of money trying to solve this. Believe me, we would love to comply with the code and not be here today. Yep. We can't do it. I got you. Okay, perfect. Thank, Thanks. Thank you. Um, hey, real quick, since we're on the subject of the specific dimensional thing, staff, could you bring up the diagram that has the, your red hatching for the variance request? Just explain one. It seems like, so we're talking about a 14 foot height differential from the 92 to the 106 along Dixie. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's on the upper right side, right? Yeah. So the, what, the what's this code state when you go to the 92? Because you can have the mechanical equipment and screens on top of that. How high can a mechanical level and screening go above the 92? Uh, if the mechanical equipment is fully enclosed uh, with a screening enclosure, we allow encroachment above the district maximum height of 20 feet. And that could be at the same plane as the level below it? Yeah, yeah. So we, we could have a mechanical room in that red zone by, by right that would be equal to the mass that they're proposing? Yes, potentially yes. Okay. So, I mean, that's another point. Th they could take the equipment room that they've set back, I believe, off of Dixie and off of Datura, kind of accomplishes what could otherwise be mass at the street. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want, so I'm clear on that. Okay. So we're talking about 14 feet, which could be a, a structure there regardless without this being a variance request. So, uh, okay, so that's just a clarification on what we're looking at there. Um, okay. I have some other stuff I'll save for later, just some general commentary. I just want to just clarify that in terms of what we're looking at in terms of this deviation, because, I mean, clearly I think what's being done on the east side is a huge benefit for the building and the street. So you, know, you take, for example, the city plaza when that came up, and we had, what, how many stories of blank wall? That's what you'd be seeing here until something's built next to it. So keep that in mind, too. Um, who else has got a question for staff or the applicant? Do you have a diagram? Nick, you got to have some. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just generally at times like these where you have an impasse, you know, you look for some kind of compromise, right? If it was landscaping, it'd be easy. We could talk about that. But with the program and particularly those floor plans, I think those things have been distilled down to the most efficient layout you could possibly imagine. And again, from... <coughs> 
people that do this all day long and have done it and you know i defer to their judgment and, and planning as to really what works best um to me generally it's a great looking project i think you know without getting into the particulars the ask of the variance that of number one and number two just physically is not that much to me and when i look about the physical realm imagining this building looking at the renderings and imagine that facade corner either being at you know 106 or 92 or 14 feet as you're as you're looking around the city so all due respect with all the input from the various parties coming in um i think i would support variance one and two yeah and i think like Gregory was saying it's usually difficult because we you know rarely do we get a condition where i don't know if we've ever had staff kind of question and approval the every variance requests are always generally they vetted it out staff is always great about working with the applicant and working through issues so i think if they're still at this point it is a unique condition unique to this project um and should warrant consideration but but to back up in general um it's i think it's a beautiful project architecturally i wish this were a special review because i wish we could see more projects like this architecturally it's it's intriguing uh, it expresses the use of the building um it's just really well done um, versus not every building is like this so you know like to commend the architectural design team for a really wonderful building and i understand as an architect that the the struggles with mechanical systems and floor to floor heights um, and i think from what i see from the evidence today the testimony that you guys have done everything you can to make the variance request de minimis um, i think the request for the east side is a huge benefit for the public environment as well as the uh, occupants of the building. So I can be in support in the variances for those same reasons that I mentioned earlier. I think you could have building mass up there regardless or without any variance requests. So I'm not even, I understand the, the basis of the variance and the black and white letter of the code. But I think this is a condition where we as a board uh, should consider the benefits of this. And I think all of their variance can be justified um, in terms of that and not necessarily creating a precedent. I don't think, again, based on these unique conditions of this, the project, the use, and the architectural expression. So, I mean, I can be in favor of the variance request and I'm wholeheartedly in favor of the architecture. So, again, nice work, um, very well done. And uh, no, no disrespect to staff, and I understand it's the letter of the law, but I, I think this is just, you know, the benefits way outweigh the uh, other issues, and I think it's all justified. So, I can be in favor of all this, but is there any other question, Kim? Um, may I just have a comment, not a question, but um, so, to maybe add, um, add an additional benefit to the public if you could, the landscaping could include as many shade trees canopy shade trees as possible I know it's just a rendering stage but there are a lot of palm trees in there and even though you know we we're Palm Beach County is uh, we, we know now that palm trees are actually not that great for the environment and for the downtown neighborhood every time there's a meeting uh, survey, informal or formal survey, um, shade trees is always on the top of residents' request. So maybe to just to add, um, to reduce the, the, the um, overbearing on the, the lack of the setback, to enhance the public experience uh, um, on, on the massing, maybe just have as much shade trees as possible, please. Do you wanna look at the landscape plan real quick? Cause I thought they had quite a few along the street there, unless I'm wrong. Was there a landscape specific plan or was that just part of the architectural presentation? I think they had the streetscape on there. Yeah, there's. Oh, I see, there's the, okay, I didn't even notice that. the palm tree, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't there a code requirement for shade trees? There right. is. Uh, there's, we, we need to provide one every 30 feet, which, which we are doing. Um, and then the palm trees are just kind of extra. I think we have three here. There are some kind of small lower scale palms that we're proposing within the landscape area um, of our project. Uh, but we are providing a canopy that wraps around, uh, you can see it here, around the west side of the building that protects, um, you know, from environmental factors. And then whenever it turns to the corner on the north, it becomes more of a brie soleil, but that's because we have a colonnade that pedestrians can walk under and be, you know, protected. Uh, from the rain and sun. So um, we do have the landscape architect here and they can speak to this uh, a little more uh, if you would like. Nick, what do you think about the palm trees? 
Well, yeah, I was going to say another other business. You know, palm trees are not bad. Um, palms and trees are, are good. I think it's just the application and the use of them. You know, I can take you to a lot of places with clustered palms that provide way more shade than some shade trees. So it's a, it depends on species and things. So uh, just as that as a general comment. But, yeah, I think the streetscaping is there with the, uh, the oaks. I think I was just also wondering, I'm sure you have following all the downtown guidelines of structural soils and best practices for our downtown trees. So that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions or discussion points for this one? I, I don't know, but I'd, you know, I would say certainly for purposes of being consistent with the comprehensive plan, this building really stands out. I don't know if that's good or bad, but when I look at all these renderings and everything else in the area, it's it's not like anything else in that area. Um, but I would just have to say that granting or denying these variances, I don't think is gonna make that difference. I think this building, if it's built architecturally the way it's designed, it's gonna look the way it does, whether or not they, they got their variances or not. So that's, um, that was my concern. I mean, architecturally, it may be beautiful. I'm not quite sure if architecturally it's it's right for that area, mm -hmm. but that's I understand that's not what we're voting on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, does anyone want to venture a motion? I think we've got this thing. Is there? I think I can do it. Yeah. I, don't, I can't. Almost there. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, I move that the Downtown Action Committee approve the variance requests included in the DAC case number 23-14 as follows. One, a variance from section 94-118 table 4-15C regarding a conditional side interior setback of 20 feet for developments above five stories or 68 feet, specifically for levels five, six, and seven of the proposed mid-rise office. The variance request is to reduce the required setback by five feet and to instead provide a side interior setback of 15 feet along the eastern facade. Two. A variance from section 94-118, table 4-15C, regarding a conditional setback of 62 feet when fronting South Dixie Highway for developments above seven stories or 92 feet, specifically for level seven of the proposed mid-rise office. The variance request is to reduce the required setback by 46 feet and to instead provide a conditional setback of 16 feet along the western facade. Three, a variance from section 94-118, table 4-15C, regarding a conditional parking setback of 31 feet when fronting Daytura Street and South Dixie Highway for developments with parking uses above three stories or 44 feet, specifically for level four of the proposed mid-rise office. The request, the variance request is to reduce the required setback by 15 feet and instead provide a conditional setback of 16 feet along the north and western facades. Four, a variance from section 94-118 table 4-15F regarding the minimum requirement of 60% active use liners for levels two and three up to 44 feet along the Daytura Street and South Dixie Highway frontages, as well as the minimum active use line or depth of 20 feet for commercial uses. The variance request is to eliminate the active use liner requirements altogether for levels two and three in order to accommodate structured parking on site. The variance approval is made conditional upon the restriction stipulations and or safeguards listed in the planning division staff report dated February 14th, 2024, that I move are necessary to ensure compliance with the purpose and intent of the zoning code and consistent with the downtown master plan and comprehensive plan of the city of West Palm Beach. 
This motion is based upon testimony presented along with the application submitted, which constitutes competent substantial evidence that the standards in Section 94-38-D6 have been met. Okay, I think you got it all. All right, so there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion, second. Any further discussion? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. Great. Thanks for everyone, uh, everyone for uh, your hard work on that presentation. Very nice. And good luck with the project. So I guess that completes today's cases. Um, Code Revision Administration, any unfinished business or new business? Any items anyone wants to discuss while we're here? No? I guess that's going to do it then. All right, we'll adjourn today's meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.